From the south shore of picturesque Lake Le Mans on the edge of the Rhone Alps region in the city of Evian in southeastern France, we welcome you to qualifying day for round number two of the 2015 UIM Formula One H2O World Championship Tour for power boating at the 19th Grand Prix of France. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Steve Michael, along with my longtime partner, multi-time world champion, Jonathan Jones, and we greet you live from the lovely city of Evian, and we are so excited about returning to this spectacular country for the first time in eight seasons and having France back on the world championship calendar once again. However, before we dive headlong into the excitement that is qualifying, let's set the stage by giving you a video postcard of this spectacular lakeside city that is Evian here in France. Elegantly perched on the border between France and Switzerland, northeast of Geneva in the East French Alps, Evian's internationally renowned healing waters have lured health-conscious visitors from around the world since 1824. It's France's most celebrated spa resort, but this is only the beginning. There are so many must-sees on your tour to Evian. Start by going to the famous water and musical gardens, followed by a trip to the thermal spa. Then try your luck at the largest theme casino in Europe. And how about a 35-minute boat trip across the lake to the lovely Riviera town of Lausanne on the Swiss side? Evian recently won the award for the best resort in France by the World Travel Awards, judging the total beauty, the proximity to summer and winter activities, all along with its famous healing waters adding up to one of Europe's must-see areas. Feel more culture, feel more water, Feel more relaxation. Feel more fun. Feel Evian France. Well, 95 days ago, the curtain went up on the season in the always tricky conditions of Doha Bay. And qualifying took place early race day morning to settle who would earn the first pole position of the season. Here's a short look back at the drama of Q3 in a top six shootout in Doha. Drivers from 11 different countries were ready to handle the rough waters at Doha Bay for the first race of the year. Eric Stark came out, and then this man came out with Ahmed Al Hamli, who did a 44-25. He did a 170-kilometer-per-hour lap looking for pole position. Up next was the driver from Kuwait, Yusuf Al Robian from the Formula One Atlantic team, did a 44-61, a little bit quicker. Up next was the world champion, Philippe Shep, looking for his third pole position in the last three races. He came by, did a blistering 43-4. He thought maybe he had a great chance, the enthusiasm of that team, as he finished off on a flyer on his last lap. But next came Sean Torrente, the driver out of Miami, Florida, looking for the pole, and he set a sizzling time as Torrente did a 42.75, and it all came down to this man, Sami Salio, looking for his 25th pole position. He couldn't get it done. He did a 45.29. The Qatar team was number one, and Sean Torrente, in his last race ever with this Qatar organization, picked up the number one spot with a sizzling 42.75. There's your top six in Doha. Welcome back, and already we've got an incident on the race course. We welcome you here live to Doha in official qualifying. It looks like it's David Del Pin, the rookie out of Italy, driving for Team Abu Dhabi, and Alex Corella's teammate. He had an accident going down in toward the front straightaway, heading down into turn number two, which is down near the far end of where we are. And you can see it here. He stabs the buoy and spears it and then uh, slides off the race course. So uh, obviously getting caught with his hand in the cookie jar, as we say, Jonathan. Boy, I'll tell you something. That's uh, something you don't want to do to start off a, a long weekend. No, you can see that uh, the turn boys actually spear, it's speared onto the front of the, of the boat there. So that's going to hold things up a little bit. You can see we're on a yellow flag at the moment. Um, Steve, water conditions have changed dramatically in the last hour, that's for sure. You know, it's getting really rough out there. Jonathan, let's talk about the circuit here. You've won this race two times in France, never here the first time we're here. This looks like a challenging course, and we're seeing it already. Yeah, it's a two-kilometer circuit, and for the first time in a lot of races, we've got an open circuit where we can actually overtake. It's so good to see that. The circuits we've run this year so, much, so far, and also all of last year, they were these sort of point and squirt circuits. No length at all to them, and no opportunity to overtake. But here in, uh, on, on the lake, here in the Evian, as you can see, you've got a wide open track, so we're going to
going to see a lot of exciting racing. We're going to see overtaking for the first time, in my opinion. And you can see there the left. <laughs> the circuit you come down past the start finish line uh, into turn number two 590 meters good length there and then you can float the boat around between turn two and turn number three and down the long back straight where the conditions are really blowing up now you can see the winds come in from the west side and we're starting to get some rollers coming out on the circuit there you've got the only right hand turn which is number four up to number five 450 meters and again you can skirt around between five and six you can float the boat around there pick up some speed as you come down to the start finish line another 360 meters yeah and of course uh, the conditions are changing uh, at the moment now they called for thunderstorms about this time of day two days ago in the weather and they kept insisting it may happen but right now we've just got scattered clouds let's talk a little bit about the official qualifying itself here's how it's going to unfold let's begin by giving you a rundown of what you're going to expect to see here in this next hour now the first we have the format of three qualifying sessions, beginning what we're doing right now in Q1, where we're gonna eliminate six of the slowest drivers in this first 20 minute session. And then following a short intermission, we'll bring the field back out onto the circuit, eliminating six more drivers. And we'll have that 20 minute Q2 session, leaving us with the top six for the shootout. At this juncture, that final pressure pack Q3 session, we'll see each driver coming out one at a time to go around this challenging six pin circuit driving for two solo laps in search of the quickest time and looking for that number one pole position here at the 19th Grand Prix of France. So that's the story with that. Now let's tell you what, Jonathan, I think uh, an interesting uh, aspect here is the Osprey rescue team, as you go on board, you can see the boats going around. They hustled out there into the corner and uh, they've got a new boat, they've got a new engine, They've uh, decked themselves out. They've kitted themselves out pretty well for 2015. The Osprey rescue team has put themselves in a position to really commit themselves for the future. Oh, they certainly have. As you say, they've designed and built two new boats. Uh, Mercury have been very helpful and uh, supplied them with uh, one, of, one or two of their latest uh, four-stroke engines and they say that they're performing really well. The bottom end on the uh, on these uh, uh, inflatables that Osprey have got is dramatically improved and as you say they've every year they improve the boats they find that maybe there's a shortfall in a certain area and these new ones are their top quality kit and uh, they're out there and they Without Osprey, we would not be racing. I certainly wouldn't be alive today. That's how important they are at, at every Grand Prix. Yeah, and it's great to see the new commitment that they've put together, con just continually changing and challenging yeah. themselves to be better and better. I'll tell you what, let's talk a little bit about the American Sean Torrente. He leads this championship, and after his victory in Doha in March, since that time, he's been scrambling. The Qatar team disbanded shortly after leaving him with no race, no ride, and little hope of continuing, but never giving up. He aligned himself with a victory organization out of Dubai. And now the 36-year-old from Florida is back and ready to attack. Let's hear from Sean Torrente. You've had three career poles. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the last race in Doha for you, getting the pole position that came down to the very end. Yeah, the um, you know goal is always pole and, and uh, it's our team, we, we got a lot of those and we were always really prepared. This is a different situation, you know, it's a new team. Um, not very much time to prepare just because of the schedule. So um, I think our goals are a little bit different this weekend, but we still are gonna try hard. Sean, you're in a Baba, you haven't been in a Baba boat for a while. Yeah, um, last time I was in one, it was really fast. Um, it didn't end the way we wanted, but we uh, we were in a very similar situation. We, we didn't have very much time to prepare and we missed the pole by just a couple hundredths of a second. So um, they're fast for sure. We just hope that uh, it all comes together and, and the team has done a really good job in the short time to, to put it all together. So um, hopefully I'm going to do my job and everything runs good and, and we'll see how we are. Now this boat particularly has got an interesting history to it and it's been sitting a bit too. So you must have gone over it quite a bit. Yeah, the guys have spent the last three days basically we're building it front to back, um, you know, 15, 16 hours a day going, just checking every nut and bolt, changing everything that they could change. Um, just trying to do the best we could to mitigate the risk of, of having a failure. I mean, that's really what it's about. So I feel pretty good about it. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how it goes in qualifying. Um, I just I want to get some time in it. Uh, get a little bit of comfort in it. Um, hopefully, it's fast enough that I can do that in Q1 and uh, give a good fight for Q2 to try and get into the shootout. Six pins around today. It's a long circuit. You got a long boat. 
Yeah, um, so if it stays really, really calm, like it is, uh, like it's been the last few days, uh, we don't have the right boat. But the thing about this place is it's a huge lake. So if there's any... <laughs> whatsoever it's going to get rough and we might not qualify one but in the race if it's at all rough we're going to have a really good setup okay two wins in the last four been on the podium eight times in the last 12 races best of luck today getting uh pole number two for 2015. thanks steve just points you need more points to defend that lead jonathan i like not only his calm but his demeanor and his confidence going into uh, this weekend yeah, I mean, the thing with Sean is that, um, you know, he, he used to be really erratic and make a lot of mistakes, but he's, he's calmed down a lot now, Steve, in the, in the last couple of, uh, couple of events. And uh, there's no question, whatever you put him in, he's going to do well. Because, you know, like, everybody's good at something. He happens to be exceptionally good at, um, at driving a powerboat. And, uh, you know, they put him in this boat. He hasn't even sat in it before today. In free practice this morning, he was the quickest. And uh, there we go. Just something of interest there, Steve. Del Pin's boat. Look, not only did he spear the, uh, the turn boy, but he's ripped half of the boat out, starting a sink at the moment. And uh, does he realize that? Look, he, the he, back of the boat is getting lower and lower. The engine is soon going to take in a lot of this water. And I can tell you, he ain't going to be out for practice this afternoon and qualifying. No, this is pretty well going to sink his chances right now, literally and physically, if he can keep on going. Of course, he's in radio communication. He's hearing from uh, the crew chief as they discuss it. And Team Abu Dhabi, of course, has hired the best, Jonathan. They've brought over from the Qatar team, which has won uh, four world championships in the last... Uh, six years and of course uh, brendan power is now the engine management director look at the engine now starting to heat up you can see it literally it's trying its best to get back to uh to the crane area yeah. and you've got to be very careful when you take this boat out if it makes it to the crane area because you don't want to lift it up at once because all that water and the weight will totally destroy the boat yeah it's obviously taken a lot of water you can see on that sponson that appears to be damaged difficult to say because what they've done is they've wrapped this boat as they do with the uh, you know fast cars these days and things like that they haven't sprayed it and we don't know whether it's the wrapping that's hanging off or whether it's half of the boat that's hanging off but it looks like it's the sponson the entire sponson and he isn't going to be going very very far. I was surprised when he was on the top turn by there, Steve, that the, the rescue people hadn't hitched him onto the front and taken him straight back to the pontoon. He's had to do a full lap all the way round, sinking as he goes along. You can see the steam coming off the back of that engine now, and uh, he's in big trouble. Well, the two people that are pushing the buttons for this team literally have well over 50 years experience, so they may have just said to him, mm. bring it back in under your own power and we can keep going with it. Well, you know, the question is, uh, how much damage is he going to inflict? As you said, it's a carbon fiber boat, a lot different than the old days when you were racing with the uh, Okoe uh, and Obichi wood that would yeah. uh, bend, flex, and then snap when you had a hard uh, hard accident. Yeah, Formula One moved into, they, they had to move with the times. And uh, in the mid 90s, uh, we started making uh, carbon fiber boats, all the various boat builders. And uh, the other thing is it opened the market to a lot more people because to build a wooden boat is very, very difficult and it needs a lot of skill. And there aren't that many people out there that can do it. Um, but with these composite boats, you basically, you make a shape of the boat you then make a mold and then you basically lay it up with with carbon fiber and it is once you get the hang of how carbon fiber works and things like that it's a lot lot easier the problem is when you want to make changes to the boat let's say you wanted to make the boat a little bit shorter alter the shape of the sponsons or whatever and now it's a major problem because you have to make the shape you have to make a separate mold and then you've got to make the part and then you've got to scarf that part into the boat and hopefully you know try and make it work so it has made boats a lot lot more expensive but obviously because these boats are away for such a long time during the year it means Means that if there are small crashes or whatever they can be repaired fairly quickly david del Penn, one of the young uh, core of youngsters racing he's just 24 years old he raced f2 last year he was third in the uh, italian championship and he was uh, seventh in the world championship david del Penn drastically uh, drastically trying to get back to the crane area i'll tell you what let's take a look at the starting lineup of drivers now we started with 12 different nations of drivers 19 in total 
that were coming here this weekend. Already we have lost one driver even before this uh, afternoon. As you take a look at the unofficial uh, time so far, we've only run one minute and 47 seconds into this, so these times don't really mean much. But really, I think the interesting thing is. <laughs> With the driver that we lost, uh, Van Ozenhofer from Austria, he failed to start uh, the race in Doha, and now it's the the tank on the boat actually split the fuel tank, and they they can't run the boat. They've got to take it back to Italy and get it fixed on the uh, the team that he runs with, which is the Motorglass F1 team with uh, Francesco Catando. Yeah, I asked him what happened, and basically in free practice this morning he was running down the back straight at quite high speed. And there were some rollers coming in from one of the ferries on the other side of this of the of the uh, <coughs> excuse me the other side of the bay. And of course he he saw the first one, and then he trimmed the engine in, which dropped the front of the nose, but he dropped it a little bit too much, and the whole thing just nose dived and went down. And because it it sort of stressed the boat as it went under the water, it actually split the fuel tank. So unfortunately he's out for today. But good news is that. Um, He's sponsored by Regal Boats uh, France, and my understanding is that now that he's committed for the rest of the season, so he's going to see. You're going to see a guy there. It's going to take some time, you know, to to get into the swing of running against some of these top drivers. But uh, you know, hopefully in in the future we'll see a, a strong uh, German driver competing. Yeah, let's take a look at actually what happened here, Jonathan, to him uh, this morning in free practice, and. Uh, as he was out there running. Now let's look for the wave here. There's the launch, and then now you're trying to save it, and you can't. You launched off the wave, you got airborne, and now you become just a passenger. You're doing your best. You're frantically trying to trim the boat up, but through the air, it happened so fast, there was no way he could correct it. No, I mean, he was doing about 135 mile an hour there, at least, going down the back straight. You could see he hit the first uh, the first uh, wash, the first wave. Um, didn't look too bad. And then as he hit the second one, there were enormous rollers in front of him. He tried to bring the boat down, otherwise he'd have blown it over and just trimmed a little bit too much, he was telling me, and nosedived. And that can happen to anybody. It's not because he was inexperienced. It's the fact that, you know, they had no idea that those rollers were on the far side of the circuit. So one driver gone, and now we have David Del Pin, the youngster, the 24-year-old out of Italy, who, by the way, enjoys rock climbing when he's not out on a boat, and he also plays American football. Mm. Wide receiver, defense, he's stopping the run, so yeah. he loves doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, the front runner in that team is obviously Alex Carella, and there's going to be a lot of pressure on him now because uh, team Abu Dhabi have changed. They got rid of Scott Gilman, who's now pick, set up another team in his own name. Um, and that's looking very, very strong with uh, Ahmed Al Hamli that was with him last year and uh, Stark, the uh, Swedish driver, looking good. But going back to Abu Dhabi, obviously they've got Carella there at the moment. Del Pin is the second driver who looks like now he could be out for the rest of the afternoon. So a lot of pressure on Alex Carella there, current world champion and a very, very strong runner out there. And uh, Abu Dhabi seem to be really throwing a lot of money at that team this year and I'm sure they're going to expect results that's for sure so every last member of that team is going to be under a tremendous amount of pressure to perform right the way through the year yeah we talk so much about the drivers championship who wins the world title but we also have the other keen championship which is the team championship itself and boy I'll tell you what that's the bragging rights and now as we shift back into what you were talking about, Jonathan, we've got new teams here involved. Let's get you updated a little bit. First of all, the victory team was Sean Torrente. Sean had the fastest time in free practice this morning. He did a 47.5. Surprised a lot of people in a boat that's been sitting literally in a shelf for two years in the heat out in uh, Dubai with the victory team. Well, the victory team is a fantastic organization, and they take nothing less than victory. So they, they realized, I chatted with them this morning, Reef Alzafine, who was there, he was a tremendous driver himself, and he was uh, talking to us a little earlier saying, listen, the reason why we took Sean on board was because we know how intensive a driver he is and how he wants to win so badly and that's what we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got the you've got the first division drivers here and then you've got the Premier League, you know, and Sean really is 
he's on top of his game at the moment, no question about it. He's very confident, but not overconfident. And like I say, whatever boat you put him in, he's going to be quick. He's got some good crew members behind him that moved from uh, Team Qatar that they disbanded earlier this year. And uh, they know exactly what they need to do. And, uh, you know, whatever boat you put him in, he's going to perform and he's going to perform right at the front and my money was on him this morning you know he said oh I, you know I, I i'm happy if i get into the top five and i said get out of here top five i said you're here to win and he said i know but you know i want to do a good job for this new victory team i mean victory obviously been sort of controlled formula one uh, class one offshore for many many years and now they run this x cat series <laughs> which is very, very successful, and they're taking that around the world. They're funding all of it. And, of course, now they've seen this opportunity with Sean. I've seen a lot of them have turned up this morning. And, uh, you know, they, they're very impressed with this driver and with the, the other members of crew that are there. And I think what they've got to do is they've got to assist them financially, obviously get involved on the technical side, but they've got to give them... Give them space. Let them do what. Don't try and dictate to them and tell them this is what we got to do. Don't upset the apple cart. Let them just get on with the job. And if they do that, then I think that will be a very, very successful team in the future. Yeah, we'll see how that plays out. Now, another team, of course, that has been added is uh, the Maverick team. Boat number 73, Cedric DeGean. Guess what, Jonathan? He's back since 2005. Mm. We hadn't seen him. Of course, he's the second generation driver of Jean Vitel, his father, who raced on the tour from 1995 through 97. Now he comes back from the French S2000 and S3000 ranks where he has won the 24 hours of Rome many times, including in 2015. So uh, he's, yes. he's a talented driver. It's great to have him back. He is, and uh, he's basically using a lot of the equipment that he uses in what they call S3000, which is a national class in France. So the boat's a little bit longer, not quite so wide with so much lift in it, and the horsepower of the engine is probably down about 75 horsepower. But, you know, he's here on home soil, and uh, he'll certainly be reliable, and he's got a lot of experience. And fingers crossed, you know, we've got two friend, three French drivers out here now. Fingers crossed um, he'll come away with a good result this weekend and then of course if he does that chances are he's going to stick with the series until the end of the year yeah no that'd be fantastic and uh, how about Christoph uh, Larigo he's with the new Emic team it's a new rebranding and He's, uh, we'll see how he does. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. He's also another rookie. So a lot of stories we're going to be talking about here in the next two days. But the good news is the green flag is coming back out. And Jonathan, we're going back into this 20 minutes of Q1. The good news is the flag's out. The bad news is the conditions have got even worse to what they were earlier on. And uh, boy, these boats are going to have a handful out there. There's no way they're going to be run at, being able to run at top speed. and. Uh, Keep a watch out for them because we could see one or two blowovers here as they go down the long back straight. Yeah, they're starting to swirl a bit. This uh, Lac Lamar on this side and, of course, Lake Geneva on the other side of Switzerland. Same lake, two different ways to call the lake body. But really, the philosophy here, Jonathan, is you know that uh, six drivers are going to be asked to leave here and the top 12 move on. So the, the fast guys need just to set one lap, and then, but that's gonna be a hairy one lap, I'll tell you that. They're gonna have to really suck it up. It's This is really entertaining stuff, because they're really teetering on the edge of disaster here. They certainly are. And the longer boats, as we said earlier on, a lot of the boats here are very, very short and difficult to control in rough conditions. So the longer boats, probably like that one that uh, Sean Torrente uh, has been talking about today, uh, that may play into his hands. Well, as we look at the youngest driver on the tour, Philip Rahms, the youngster out of uh, Finland, and he came in here. He's Sami Celio's teammate. Started the year in 13th and uh, finished up in the eighth position. So uh, we just kind of roll along here. We don't really have the timing working at the moment, but. Uh, Use your watch, Jonathan. We'll do it the old yeah. way here. Yeah. I mean, when we say the timing's working in that they can register the times, but we, we don't at the moment know exactly how much time there is before they finish the first session. And some of these boats really bouncing around out there, Steve. You watch, you can see them there now. You can see Philip Roms there, that young driver from Finland. Uh, he's got a slightly longer boat, but uh, I don't know. I, I'm sure he's not going to like these conditions out here this afternoon. And... Uh, it's going to be interesting. But at the moment, let's look at where we are. Number one, uh, Rosef, uh, Josef, I beg your pardon, Al Rubayan, 
um, running there. Uh, 0.77, Sami Salio now starting slowly but surely to pick up speed. Carella in third, Philip Roms in fourth, pretty good. Cedric de Guin, you know, I said he had this big bolt. It'll suit these conditions. He's up in fifth there. Philip Chap in sixth. Uh, Stark in seventh. Now he's dropped down to eighth. Things are changing. Chiap, the French driver, the guy that we're all looking out for this year, world champion last year, and he's up in seventh at the moment. And he's o they're only going to do what they need to do. They're not going to take any chances in this first session, Steve. Absolutely. As long as they're in those in that top 12 boats, they're going to be happy. Absolutely. And we talked about that. You just need one lap, one hard lap to get you into that top 12 to move on and hope the conditions get better in Q2. <laughs> So, so far, some of the winners are, look at Jesper Fors, he's in that fourth spot. Philip Roms is in the fifth spot. So some of the youngsters with Cedric DeGuin up in the fourth, fifth, and sixth spot still waiting to move up. Well, let's take a look. Marit Strumoy down in 15th. Sean Torrente down in 14th position. And uh, Ahmed al Hamli in the 12th position. So uh, we're just kind of <coughs> waiting to see some of the stronger drivers. They may be taking their time, biding their time to find a, a good lap to make a run at it. Yeah, keeping an eye now. Uh, here we go, Torrente back on the circuit. And boy, is he going there as he comes down past us. First position, 1.89 seconds. You could see the balance of that boat is absolutely perfect, Steve. You know, they've obviously moved a lot of the ballast around in the boat, put some nose weight in there so the nose doesn't start flying too much. Pick the right propeller that holds the back of the boat in the water. You can see there, number seven, Sean Torrente, 1.89 ahead now. He's done enough. He just needs to get off that circuit because I honestly don't feel that by the end of this session the conditions are going to get any better. Sean Torrente, who's got Alex Kanzi with him now on the headset. Interesting aspect of the of the team that he now is building around him because he's got two people that were at one time part of the Qatar team and were not asked to go to Team Abu Dhabi when Brendan Power went and Bill Rucker went. So uh, they're uh, they're out to uh, push their old driver as hard as they can. Of course, they worked with Alex Corella. But they've also been very, very close with Sean Torrente, so they've got something to prove here, this victory team today. Yeah, they certainly have. Al Hamley now moved up into second position, the Abu Dhabi driver that just over 12 months ago um, was in really bad shape. I mean, uh, he had a, a, a brain tumor, um, and the, the government in Abu Dhabi um, got him out to, um, I believe it was... Uh, Dayton or somewhere like that in, in America. John they Hopkins. operated on him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's amazing that he's he's looking so well, but it, truly amazing that he's out of port here, uh, running in second position, now dropped out to third, Alex Carella to second. And, you know, as I say, doing a hell of a job there. But he's got such a passion for the sport, Steve. That's why he's determined to carry on racing. Well, there you see Sean Torrente. What has he done lately? Well, he's now leading in the championship, won the opening round in Doha, has earned 20 points. You get 20 points for the win 15 for second 12 for third and so on and so forth so he leads this championship he's won two of his last four races four straight podiums eight podiums in the last 12 starts as we look at the uh, youngster coming back Cedric to really not a youngster anymore it's been uh, nine years since the last time we saw him he's 41 years old and again he's a second generation driver who's had eight starts he's had one top 10 his father only had one top 10 too, isn't that interesting? Yeah, look at the boat of him, Steve. You can see it's narrow in the tunnel, so it hasn't got too much lift. Um, it's very, very long, and it's perfect for these conditions. And at the moment, even though he's down something like 75 horsepower on some of these other boats there, he's hanging in there, sixth position, 2.5 off pole at the moment, and looking good. And of course, a driver like him, who's a marathon driver for hour after hour in the 24-hour races and the six-hour races, hey, this is this is cake. You run for an hour and 15 minutes for three qualifying sessions. This is easy for him. Yeah, you can see all these other boats bobbing around on the water there as they try to keep control as they go down the straights. But you look how smooth he is in that boat. Number 73, the French driver there, doing a hell of a job and uh, still hanging in there. Oh, he's dropped one position. Now he's down to seventh. But I'm sure he's going to be very very, very happy with the way that boat's going. No, I think he'll do well. Now, he came to Formula One all the way back in 2004. Remember, we said we haven't seen him since 2005. With the Camparado Racing Team, his first race was in Mumbai in India. And he started six races that year, with India being his best qualifying result, which was 14th. 
and his best career finish is a 10th. So his best ever is 14th. It'd be fun to watch him to see how he does. And here's a guy that's uh, been running uh, steady. Yeah, Trying to improve. Sami Celio, third quickest. Celio, as we talked about, has got 20 plus pole positions. He knows how to win. I'll tell you something. His first ever win was here in France back in La Rochelle in 2007 when he came up with his first victory in 2007 went on to win the world championship that year. Yeah yeah you could just see there Sammy Celio there now trying to sort of pick a good spot where he sees that the conditions sort of seem to calm off a little bit before he goes for it. He's in third position at the moment he's only 0.8 uh, of a second off pole so he's sitting pretty there and we just saw coming going into shot uh, a few moments ago you could see um, um <laughs> Rogero from Italy there helping the team and uh, also building these Baba boats the boat that actually Sean Torrente is running as you can see the camera there behind him but Sammy Celio again just waiting biding his time there keeping wide of all the other boats waiting for a, a clear spot for, to see if he can improve on his time. Celio in his 126 career start has 12 victories in his career he's had 39 podiums He's been in the top six shootout 78 times in his career. So he knows how to get to the front. And as I said, he's had 22 pole positions in France here. He's raced four times. Now, he is one of three drivers, by the way, that raced in chalon sur son which was back in 2000. So 15 years ago, as you look at Jonas Anderson. Now, Anderson finished fourth at the first race in Doha. And uh, I think he's got a few tricks up his sleeve. He's going to be a contender here this weekend. Yeah, they've built, uh, they basically kept the cell of this boat, but they've redesigned the entire boat. Um, the, the boat builder Molgard from uh, Denmark has worked on some new sponsors. Uh, he's very, very happy with it. He's got some new sponsorship now from, uh, from one of his good friends who runs a, um, a, a, a machine type of company that dig roads and, and the like uh, out in uh, Sweden. And we're going to give them a good mention this weekend Steve because uh, they're really helping Jonas uh, creep his way back to the top because on his day if everything's running right that guy is as quick as anybody out here. Always trying the newest and latest in technology you'll notice on our screen that we were showing you just moments ago G meters as Jonas goes to number two up on the uh, board just behind uh, uh, Joseph Al uh, Robian, who is uh, number one Torrente's down in third but uh, again they're just trying to get to the top 12 get there hold it there and try to move on to Q2 to get you into the top six. Yeah Chiap now found a little bit of clear water there let's see what he can do on this lap down the far end of the circuit they've got to be really careful there because the rollers are coming in from the far end and we're on board with him now Steve so you can see a complete lap with a French driver with a current world champion and you can see how rough the water is there as he skips along to the far end of the circuit. Yeah comes by in turn number one heads down into turn number two look at the beautiful uh, layout here along the marina as he works his way around he's up into that fifth position now he's about eight tenths of a second behind the leader Al Robin and that beautiful Moore built boat continually updating the boat he went through three different boats last year design improvement improvement and improvement a third time and that was what he needed because he had a win back to back victories in Abu Dhabi and Sharjah he did just that from the pole and won the world title. Yeah, very, very close knit team. This is um, the boats are built in France by uh, David Moore, and he's doing a marvelous job working very, very closely with Chiap there. The engines come from uh, Alex Ledden in Canada. He's probably one of the main guys of en tuning these Mercury engines, and he really is on top of his game. And they're now using new propellers from a guy called Mr. Dynamite from. Right. Never seen him before this year, but he's he's been working on these propellers over the winter. And I said to Philippe, how do they how do you find them? Good acceleration, he said. Very, very strong propellers doing a great job for us. So that's why they've got this strong package, which enabled them to win the championship last year. And you'll see he's one of the main, he's one of the front runners for, for, for this season as well. Yeah, Mr. Dynamite's here and he's watching and he's helping his best uh, because he came up with some wonderful ideas for for propellers for Philippe at the very end of last season enough to propel him to that championship. Now remember last year at this time Philippe Shep finished in second place at the opener in Doha. Alex Carella won the original race in 2014. Then he took no points in the second race of the season. So he really caught up and then lunged his way to the championship coming from behind. So Philippe Shep 
got to be feeling good right now. I mean, hey, he's feeling the pressure, but he's handling it well. There's been so much media attention here in France really focusing in on this yeah. world champion, and why yeah. not? And he's in that uh, fifth position at the moment, but like I say, don't read too much into that because he's a wily driver and he knows I'll do just enough so I can get into the next session. There's no point trying to set the world alight now. It's when he gets into that top six is when they're all going to really have to push. But we've got Rubayan, the Q80 driver, up in first. Jonas Anderson now in second, Torrente third, and Sammy Selyu in fourth. Yeah, and right now it's desperation time for a few drivers because we're less than... Uh, two minutes before we wrap this thing up in the top 12 who's out of it so far well center to gain is 13th merit strong <laughs> oh, oh. oh. is in 14th guess what we've seen this from her before and uh, farther down is uh, leo zhuang in the 15th spot you can look down on your screen and see the final uh, Four boats with uh, Bartek Marzalak, who has come back and joined Formula One here with the uh, Rainbow team. And uh, I'll tell you something for him, or make that the Motor Glass team, and for him, and then uh, David O'Pin's out. So, Duarte Benevente didn't even start, didn't even come out, and that's a mystery to me, Jonathan. I don't know what happened. Mm. So, uh, that's a shame for the Portuguese driver who has the representatives from Porto here this weekend as they get set oh, right. for our next Grand Prix. And that'll be in a month's time when we head to the lovely location of Porto in Portugal. And oh my, woo, hanging out at the very end yeah, right hey, in front of yeah. us. And off the screen, Cedric Deguin launched the boat. He's trying desperately, Jonathan. He is sitting there just on the outside looking in. And, uh, Looks like Christophe Larigo has done well. He's moved himself up into the top 12. He is in the 12th position. And for him, he's on the catbird seat. And uh, tell you what, I think he's moved into Q2 here, Jonathan, as the time is pretty much over here. We're down to the final few seconds. Anything can happen. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and you can see there Bartek Marzalak, the Polish driver, pushing there, but the boat doesn't look very well balanced on the water. It's, again, one of these very short DACs. Tremendous acceleration and mid-range, but when the conditions get like this, you've really got to be a top driver. And I think he's only had this boat recently, and so hasn't done a lot of testing. And uh, he's enjoying Formula One, but I bet he's not enjoying being out there today, that's for sure. As we look at Bartek, just in front of him is Marit Stromoy. And she has done so much to try to make giant improvements with her boat. As we watch her now in desperation, she's done this so many times, Jonathan, just when you think she's going to be tossed out of Q2, not get there. She does it at the last second. Right now, she's down in 14th, Jonathan. She's going to need to move herself up uh, about three and a half seconds. The whistle comes out. Checkered flag. And for her, it looks like this is her last opportunity, Jonathan. It's all or nothing now. She's got two more corners. Can Marit Stromoy fight her way and surprise the rest of the field as she comes out of the corner? We're about ready to find out. Out of the last corner. Boat looking not too bad out there, Steve, as it runs on the water. All right, we is hold our breath, get Jonathan. Did she go up higher? And uh, she unofficially did not. No. She did not move. That wow. surprised me. But Steve, I don't know whether she was too late coming out. I think they'd actually called the uh, the time session before she came around. She was about 10 seconds too late crossing the line to do a fast lap, and that means she's out. And that will hurt her tomorrow. There's no question about it because grid position here is paramount. If you can get pole position, you've got a straight line into the first turn. You've got the shortest amount of distance to cover, so it'll mean a big thing, even on a circuit like this. But I'll tell you something, Steve. What's going to be good about tomorrow, I, am, I have no doubt in my mind, if the conditions stay like this, we are going to see a belter of a race. This is going to be one of the best races that we've seen this year. Because like I said earlier on, for the first time, you've got open water, you've got space, we can actually overtake. So all these spectators that have come from all around Europe to watch this Grand Prix, they're going to be in for a good day tomorrow. Yeah, I think it's going to be fantastic because there's creating possibilities of a lot of passing tomorrow and that's exactly what you need to have so that's been uh, a wonderful wonderful addition so as the drivers start to come out we have uh, eliminated as we talked about there were 18 drivers that took the flag for Q1 down with uh, six drivers gone and Christophe Larico the French rookie and that number 51 machine made it on to the Q2 session as her 
more noted teammate Marit Strumoy. And Marit Strumoy, who has earned a pole position in her career, she did not get any farther than Q1 because she finished in that 14th position, part of that new Emic team based out of Abu Dhabi. So there you see Bartek Marsalak, the driver who didn't start the year, Bartek raced last year, and uh, the driver from Poland whose father was a many-time world champion in different classes, and um, this is his fourth season. He was tied for seventh last year. He picked up a total of 16 points. He finished in the top 10 in every race last year. His best weekend, by the way, was the fifth, as you look on, and you can see uh, some of the other drivers uh, parking their boats and getting themselves all uh, queued up and ready to go. So there you go. These are the top uh, positions after that Q1 session. Yusuf Al Roban, known for his speed in Formula 2, jumps to the top of the table. Remember, as you look farther down, only the top 12 move on. These are the drivers that have disappeared and will not get an opportunity to go for pole position. So Yusuf Al Roban from Kuwait, known as a speed merchant. We go back to zero numbers, though, however. We go into Q2, and then we start anew for 20 minutes. And, and only at that time will uh, we'll get a chance to see. Let's go down to Jonathan. Jonathan, you're right up in the mix in timing and scoring. What's going on, buddy? Okay, so with me here we've got Alex Ranovanovic, who's actually uh, running uh, um, uh, Josef Alrubayan, who's leading at the moment out there after the first test session. Bolt looks very strong. Uh, he looks good out there. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, it looks very strong. Uh, I'm even surprised with this. Uh, the conditions are really, really bad, but we push as much as we can, and we are really happy with this result. How, how have you got the balance of the boat so good? Because he's now running one of these very, very short boats, the very white ones, but it looks really good on the top of the water. It's skipping right over the top, isn't it? Yeah, we try to do our best. This so, is our secret. So is that down to ballast? Are you putting weight in the front of the boat to keep the front of the boat down? You know, how do you go about setting up a boat for these rough conditions? Yeah, we put a little bit more weight in the front, so the boat, uh, I think it performs really well. Yeah, and do you reckon there's a chance that he may get pole position here today? We'll see, but we like this condition. Okay, good luck, Alex, and uh, best of luck for the race tomorrow as well. All right, Alex. Alex Radovanovic, and I'll tell you something. He uh, was a longtime racer in Formula One. His father, actually, was the first driver ever from... Uh, the uh, Yugoslav region to uh, race in Formula One many, many years ago. So uh, Alex is uh, now watching his uh, buddy and uh, longtime friend Yusuf Al Robian do well and uh, good for him. So he moved himself up to the top of the order ahead of Jonas Anderson and Sean Torrente. And as the drivers slowly make their way out, there's Leo Zhuang. What a shame for the driver out of Shenzhen, China. In that 15th position, he will not move on any farther. He is the teammate of Philippe Shep. And for Leo Zhuang coming into uh, this race, this is his 15th career start. And Leo was hoping to uh, move into uh, Q2. Last year he had three top 10 finishes, but um, he was seventh in Doha this year. Second every race uh, for him. This is the second race ever in Europe. And uh, he raced in Kiev back in uh, 2014. So uh, Leo Zhuang done for the afternoon. The boat taken out of the water. We are set just moments away from kicking off Q2. Let's go back to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, what do you got, buddy? Sorry, John, I threw it to you too quickly. All right, we look, continue to look, and there you can see uh, boat number uh, 51. And uh, that is the driver that was the big surprise for everybody here in France, as it was the driver who came up as a rookie as Christophe Larico out of France now uh, getting set for a Q2 session for him. Good for him. And, uh, of course, we talked about Merit Strumoy, his teammate, not moving on. This is his first race. He started racing, though, 15 years ago. So Christophe Valerico is not a rookie by any means. As we look farther down the dock, tremendous crowds here this afternoon along the Lac, Lac Lamar. We're glad he was with us. Steve Michael and Jonathan Jones, two-time winner of this race. The new Emirates team. Scott, conditions really rough out there today. How's your driver Al Hamley finding it? 
Um, he's finding it quite rough. The goal is to get in the top 12 in the first session and not push too much. And uh, second session's coming up, and it's when the pressure starts to come. You need to push to get in the top six now. Is he confident that he can get into the top six with the boat that he's running? I know he's running a Baba boat, but it is one of those quite short boats and the wide boats for acceleration. It must be a handful out in this water. Does he feel he, he can hold the boat on the water and get a good time? Um, we're hoping. I think it's not only him has a handful. I think everyone has a handful out there. So it's, uh, it's going to be a challenge for him. And we hope uh, Hamid and Eric both can uh, meet the challenge and get both the team, Emirates team, Sanaa, and uh, our team into the top six for sure. Yeah, good luck. Thank you very much. Scott Gilman, Mr. Cool from SoCal, California, out of Los Angeles, a four-time world champion. Here on our circuit, he won the race. In France back in 1997. 23 career victories for Scott Gilman. And of course, uh, he was uh, asked to move along when uh, earlier this year, Team Abu Dhabi decided they wanted to make driver changes and he didn't feel like, well, maybe that's not the right thing to do. And they said, well, okay, we're going to do what we have to do. And Scott Gilman was... Um, uh, moved on farther down in the city of Abu Dhabi and started his own race team and he's been working diligently to put the sponsorship package together and they have a wonderful array of sponsors now on that race boat so uh, Scott Gilman well deserved and he just recently moved back to his summer home in Italy so Scott Gilman now trying to get his young driver focused and back again let's go back Jonathan who do you got Here we are now with uh, Philippe Desertan, uh, the team uh, crew chief and the team owner of Team China with his driver, Philippe Chap, current world champion, looking very, very good out there today. Philippe, how is Chap finding the conditions? Uh, it's quite hard and uh, at the moment we don't want to take any risk. Uh, the most important in going Q2 and we hope that Q3 will be tomorrow morning on the flat condition. But uh, it's like a lottery for us uh, with this type of water. So we follow the rule. We go on Q2 and try to be on top six. And uh, let's see what's happened after. So you, do you think at the moment that they're going to run Q3 tomorrow morning because of the conditions? For me, I think it will be more safe. But uh, we are under UEM rule and uh, we are waiting all information. And tell me, how do you think the Moore boat is going to run this year? Because I know you de you've been developing that boat over the last two years. And at the end of last year, you know, Philippe Chap and the entire team were very, very much on top of their game. Are you fairly confident for this year? At the moment, uh, the boat is fantastic, especially also on the rough water. It only depends on which, which type of risk we are able to take. We are uh, thinking about this race, but also the full season. So... For the boat, it's we are 100% uh, sure that uh, is very fast on flat water and on a rough condition also. So what you're saying is it's not all about winning, it's about being consistent and getting points right the way throughout the year that could you make you world champions for the second time. Ah, of course we are working on that and uh, let's take uh, race one by one, but for sure uh, our objective is to finish on the top uh, first <laughs> okay good luck good luck this weekend because we know there's going to be a lot of people watching out for philippe chap uh, the french driver and the current world champion racing out here on the water today and tomorrow all right jonathan you come back and join me here in the location the broadcast booth over on the east side of the complex here in timing and scoring nice job getting a chance to get the inside scoops on drivers just uh, had uh, marita stromoy come by and i'll tell you what let's uh Marita, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to put you on a uh, headset here and uh, tell us uh, exactly what a shame. I mean, this is obviously where you didn't want to be, but uh, instead, uh, they're 14th place and uh, you can't move on any farther today. No, I mean, these conditions is really the worst thing I could have uh, considering my new very, very short boat. So, and oops, oh shit, sorry. <laughs> uh, one had to go there. Was about to go there. No, I'll tell no, you it's, what. it's 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 not racing. This is just stupid for me. Okay. It's a hole of a meter, and uh, it can appear wherever and whenever. So for me, it's just uh, it's just luck that no one hasn't turned over yet. Right. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We got high hopes for you. 
for tomorrow, and yeah, uh, hopefully the weather conditions will be better. Yeah. We'll see how this plays out. Thank you, Merrick. What a shame. Reed Stromoy out and uh, not moving on any farther. And uh, it's, a, it's just a shame that uh, we had such high hopes for Marie Strumway said, bring Jonathan back in. I mean, and she's saying this thing is a, this thing is just way over the head of a lot of people right now. It's just kind of a survival test. So we're going to try to get in this session here. We've got uh, two minutes in. A lot of hops skipping and jumping on these boats as they go through. And uh, this is really going to be uh, intense. The intensity of trying to put in a fast lap to get to the top six. Jonathan. Will they go over the edge? This is the big question right now. Well, you know, this is all about experience and about boat balance on the water. You know, I was talking about it earlier on. It's all about putting ballast into that boat so that you can run at a fairly good speed and the boat is controllable. <laughs> on top of the water. Now, like I said earlier, again, the longer boats are going to be more suited to this water. And some of these French guys that have just come along for this race, we may see them having a good finish here this year, you know, because they're running very, very strong out there. Uh, but Rubayan at the moment, he's put up a time. He's in first again. I did speak to Alex Radovanovic, who was saying that, uh, you know, he was looking strong. Torrente now has moved into, uh, into the lead six seconds uh, behind. Philip Stark now in that second, so it's changing all the time, Steve. Yeah, Eric Stark, uh, 2.6 seconds back. He had a great flyer. Now Alex Corella jumps back up into that number two position, 1.52 seconds, getting closer and closer to Sean Torrente. Two and a half minutes into this 20-minute uh, voyage that we're going to be taking here on this very rough and difficult 2.34 course. And now we've got yellow flag coming up, and it looks like... Um, that's, uh, looks like it's Gantando, uh, Gantando think, Steve, boat yeah. number 24. What a shame for the driver. The, the veteran driver out of Milan, Italy, and for Catando now, he for himself is starting his 151st race. He goes all the way back to 1996 when Wuxi in China. He's had 42 podiums. He's had 12 victories, Jonathan. Many people say, look, he took on the challenge of his family building their own boats. They didn't want to be a follower of the DAC boats that were built in Como, Italy by Guido Capellini. Still are today by big numbers here. And he decided to go in a different direction. A lot of people said if he had just focused in on getting a decent DAC boat, he'd be a multi-time world champion. He hasn't gone down that highway, though, however. And for him, uh, he's uh, doing his best to try to come up with something. But he's one of the three drivers that raced here in uh, all the way back in uh, Shalon in 2000, 15 years ago. Yeah, and to be honest, Steve, I mean, these waters should suit a, a, an experienced driver like Cantando. I mean, when it comes down to the slick water, he's always struggling, you know, at the moment. He's down in seventh or eighth, something like that. He hasn't got the speed of some of these top guys, although he definitely has the experience, that's for sure. And I thought this weekend, this may play into his hands, you know. Having this slightly longer boat here in these conditions, I mean, surely with the experience that he's got, I thought he'd be right up there, but he seems to be struggling at the moment. And uh, where is he? He's down in 11th position, so, you know, he needs to move up to what you call, and he's got some kind of technical problem. Yeah, he never finished a lap, Jonathan. We never even got him recorded on 11th. Okay. So, okay. so the thing is with him, now remember, he's this guy has got a lot of uh, zest, and uh, he really pushes the boat to the max. Remember what happened in Lati in Finland a few years ago? He went storming toward number one, and the waves were well over a meter high. He just launched the boat, went, went around... Uh, Guido Capellini, okay. but uh, ended his day shortly after that. But he's not shy about taking on a challenge of uh, heavy water. And we got heavy waves and water right now here on this race course as we've got the yellow flag out in Q2. Yeah, and like I said, like I said earlier on, Steve, he's. Um uh, you know, he is one of the top drivers. He's one of the most experienced drivers. And, uh, you know, let's see how it pans out tomorrow. I think if he can keep the whole thing together, I think he'd be really good. All right, we come back. There you see, we've done over five and a half minutes here of this 20 minute session expected. And uh, again, on the water, we can see the drivers. There's Yusuf Al Robian, who was at the number one uh, position for a brief time. And he's dropped down into the four spot. Remember, the top six, only these six, will move on for the qualifying session and getting a chance to run for pole position. 
I tell you, I can see Sean Torrenti on the far end of the circuit there, uh, Steve. And boy, is he flying that boat on top of the water. He's in number one slot at the moment, 1.52 seconds ahead of Carella. But he's looking really strong out there. And these conditions seem to be getting worse and worse as time goes on. All right, Torrenti came around. He set the fast time. He's done a 59.65 as he tips toes through the Ooh. corner. Oh, my, he got caught up in a crosswind in the wave side by side. Hanging on now, teetering on the edge of disaster, <laughs> getting it back up. Wow, was that fantastic running. Torrente, did he go faster? Let's see what he did. Yes, he did. He did a 58-5-1. We're having fun with him. But, boy, was that a struggle yeah. to get that sub-59 second lap, and he's backing off. But, Steve, he's having fun out there. You know, he's enjoying it. He'll take any conditions on. If it's calm or if it's smooth or, you know, if it's rough and the wind's blowing, he can just about handle most things. Yeah, and Ahmed Ahami just went by and said, oh, yeah? I can go quicker. And he did. And start. Eric's. And Rubayans moved back into number one slot. So that's how fast the changes from first to fourth. And remember, and Celio in that fifth place and now... <laughs> in the sixth spot. Those are the six. If it stopped right now, it would be moving on to Q3, but we still got a long way to go in this fun, zesty session. Just when you think they can't go any faster, they keep going faster. And Yusuf Arobian's in that number one spot with a 57-1-3, and he's almost a second quicker than anybody else on this race curve right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, you know, when I spoke to Alex Radovanovic there earlier on, he was saying, he's, he said, Yosef is really surprising me because we knew we had a good balanced boat, but he's handling these conditions beautifully out there at the moment, but it's still wide open. Seven minutes and 50 seconds taken, 12.08, 12, 12 minutes to go to the end of the session. Yeah. So a lot can happen yeah. here. A bit of a quandary now for uh, Sean Torrente. Do you push again? You're down in the fourth. Yeah, he's pushing again. <laughs> he's Ooh, going for huh? it. You know, you're kind of caught in the middle here. Now Torrente's down in the fifth position. He's got jumped by a Sami Celio, who goes to the number one spot. Does a 56.08. Oh, my. Sami Celio looking for his 23rd career pole position. Feeling good. And there's his teammate, Philip Roms, who's now dropped down into seventh position. Now down into eighth position. He's drifting rearwards. Torrente now all the way down in the sixth spot. He's going to have to keep pushing here as they come uh, around on the backside of this race course. So it all comes down to this, Jonathan. Who's got the best setup and who's got the uh, the best uh, balance in these boats in these kind of conditions? Yeah, yeah, but you can see there, Roms there, trying as best he can. I mean, he's not far off, Steve. He's in eighth position. I know he's 3.69 off that uh, off that pole at the moment with Sammy Sellio, but uh, he's certainly going for it. And moving up the ladder, Jonas Anderson jumps up and joins the fray, which kicks Torrente down into the seventh position. So our young driver out of Miami is going to have to somehow gather it back up and really push. Look at Celio do the dance on the water as he gathers it back up. He almost puts the boat on its back. Was able to save it as he tiptoes his way down, spots and to spots and touching the water. And here's his teammate. Philip Rom's going to try to do his best. He's down in ninth. He's got to move up. And right now, he's got to pick up 1.4 seconds to get him up into the top six. And now the guy on the bubble is Sean Torrente. He's going for another lap. He's got a fairly clear water ahead of him. I bet he's hoping that there's none of this rough water is going to come in from the far end of the circuit. And he can complete this lap and do a good uh, a good uh, time. But seventh at the moment, not enough for, that, uh, for the shootout. Well, you know the old saying, the cream rises to the top. And we're seeing it right now. Sami Selyu, a two-time world champion in the number one spot. Nobody's got more polls than he does actively right now on this tour. And uh, at the moment, he's 1.05 seconds ahead, as you mentioned, as we watch Ahmed al Hamli in that boat. As we pick up the world champion in that number one position, that's Philip Shep, and he's got to get to the top six in a hurry. He's down to ninth, and here comes Torrente. Did he move up? Well, he moved up to spot. He moved up one. Moved up into the sixth position. He's on the he's on the bubble now. Carella now in third, going for another run out there. I think they're slowly but surely, Steve, getting used to the conditions out here. As uh, Chiap flies past us there, fourth position at the moment, sitting comfortable for a top six. Yeah, but he just kicked Torrente back down into the seventh position with that run. Yeah, the conditions, I think, have got rougher, but what they've done is, after that first session, you could see a lot of people crane the boats out. They added more ballast to keep that boat stuck onto the water a little bit more, and they're now getting used to these 
incredibly difficult conditions out on the circuit here. Just hanging on, doing their best here as you take a look now with just nine minutes remaining in this Q2 session as we eliminate six more boats. We go from 12 to six, and those people hoping to get into Q3, well, they'll come out one by one, solo laps. They get a chance to run a pair all by themselves to see who can steal pole position and start number one tomorrow for the 19th Grand Prix of France. It'll be starting 1,500 local time and 1,300 GMT. And we'll have it right here for you live. Don't forget to join us here on the website, F1H20 as well. Torrente still in seventh position there, waiting on the far end of the circuit. Water conditions look just a slightly bit better now as he goes for a run around there and just to see if he can get that sixth position and move into the uh, to the shootout. But boy, the boat handling really, really badly. I think he needs to put some weight in the nose of that to keep it there so that he can lift the boat on top of the water. If he does that with a, with a lot of weight up on the front, Steve, it'll level the boat out and allow him to push a little bit harder and get into the top six. He's got plenty of time. He's got seven minutes and 55 seconds. <laughs> remaining you are watching our current world championship points leader in the drivers championship we've won one time we've run the race in doha 95 days ago and uh, doha bay and it was so bad there that day the way the wind conditions were that we really literally had to wait till early morning race day we were down here and the sun was coming up hmm. we're out there running q2 q3s yeah yeah here we are we're picking up again torrente on that far street the number 77 boat that's a Baba boat built by uh, Massimo Ruggiero in northern Italy. Um, my understanding is that the engine that he's got on the back there at the moment is uh, obviously a Mercury 2.5 two-stroke engine. Uh, the tuning being done by Nico Van Akelian from Belgium. Um, Nico's a very, very experienced uh, uh, mechanic and, and tuner of these uh, Mercury engines. And uh, go, oh, Torrente is having a hard time. The way the boat is bouncing on top of the water there with him. He's got a handful, isn't he? I said earlier he was having fun out there. <laughs> I think I changed my mind now. Yeah, I think he's really struggling now. As you said, possibly the way the nose comes up on that boat, he's literally flying that boat around. It's not sticking to the water much. No, and you see what happens, Steve? If you back off, then the boat will not handle as well. You've got to keep your foot down, three-quarter throttle, something like that, and run the boat on the trim. As you can see, almost loses control on the far end of the circuit there where, he, where he's going over those waves. He has to trim the boat out and he has to control the boat by the throttle rather than the trim that moves that engine in and out. Just in front of him in the sixth spot is Ahmed El Hamli and guess what? He's staying right out there. He, uh, the two of them are shadowing each other, watching them because they know that uh, either one of them could get burned and be sent out of the top six and thus not have a chance to run for pole here in a little while in Q3. So Al Hamley, who is on the catbird, say Torrente looking on the outside, trying to get in. You can see Al Hamley there now, trying to go for another lap. The boat is, no, that's, that's sorry. That's uh, Al Hamley's teammate there on the far end of the circuit. But you can see Torrente there flying down past us, the boat all, almost out of control as he tries to improve on that seventh position. Yeah, and Eric Stark, who's down behind Torrente, is right behind him. He's trying to get in because he's in the eighth position. So yeah. you've got the sixth, seventh, and eighth place boats out there right now, hammering around lap after lap, desperately trying to find some clear water. Coming back in is uh, Philip Roms. And at uh, 10th position, uh, whether he'll make a late change or not, we're not sure. But uh, we've got just over five minutes remaining. Now five minutes and 10 seconds. So this drama is going to pick up in scale with almost hurricane force as they come out of the corner now. Now they fly through. We keep an eye on that final corner. Here comes Torrente down the front straightaway. Let's see what he does. He's determined this time. Torrente has gone up and moved into the second place position. And he is run a 56-4-5. You know, because the conditions are the way they are, it didn't look very exciting at all. But my word, it just shows you the drama of the race course as Eric Stark fights his way by. He's trying to get in. He's in eighth place. Stark now desperately trying to get the Emirates boat in as both Emirates team boats are seventh and eighth, Jonathan. They're fighting each other or fighting together to try to get up into the top six. And Jonas Anderson now in the sixth position is sitting on the catbird seat. 
Tell you what, Ahmed Al Hamli needs four tenths of a second. Eric Stark needs about eight tenths of a second to improve to get up into the top six. Al, Al Hamli there, Steve, just through the right hand at 450 meters straight there into where is the really the worst end of the circuit with the rollers coming in. He's coming around the far end there. You can see he's thrown the boat into that last corner. Is he going to improve on that uh, position at the moment, seventh? Is he going to get into the top six? Oh my, what a flyer he took. Did you see that, Jonathan? He's still there. Oh, Did look at that. <laughs> Almost <laughs> nosedived that boat as he as he put up that time and got into second position overall. Talk about desperation and talent and verve and luck. As we can see him coming off the corner now. This is the man to watch, Eric Stark. As we're down to three and a half minutes to go, and Stark is just as desperate as anybody else. He's in that eighth place, Jonathan. Yeah, this is the lap he's got to do it, Steve. And he was flying on the top of the water there, the boat almost out of control. He's obviously running with a little bit of negative trim. That means that the engine is actually tucked under the tunnel, which doesn't allow it to have too much lift. But what happens then is that the boat slaps on the water as it goes around, and if you hit a big wave, you... <laughs> could quite easy, easily lose control. Loads of drama now out on the race course. There you see Jonas Anderson, the Swede. He's on the catbird seat. He's sitting in the sixth and final spot as he goes whistling by. And now Ahmed al Hamli. he's pushing. Did he move up any? No, he's still down in the seventh spot. So he and his teammate, Eric Stark, with the Emirates team, seventh and eighth. And they're trying to knock on the door and get up. There's Stark. He's in the eighth position. Again, he needs to improve by about uh, six tenths of a second. So let's see if he can do it here. Are the conditions getting any better, Jonathan? I don't think they are. I think they're pretty much the same as they have been for best part of this session. You can see they're very difficult for these boats, especially, as I said, for these short, long, uh, wide boats, you know, that are not used to these conditions. But they're trying their utmost there. Jonas Anderson's still out. He's in, in that sixth slot at the moment. He knows he's going to have to put up a better time if he can keep there into the top six. And you can see there Al Hamley behind him trying to improve on his lap trying to get around the far end of the circuit there the boat bouncing from side to side almost losing control there Steve as he comes round into the start finish line less than two minutes to go one minute 45 seconds time for maybe one or two more laps maximum for these drivers as we go on forward there you get a chance to see Ahmed Al Hamli Al Hamli in the seventh position he still needs to find five tenths of a second to jump past Jonas Anderson. So you've got the sixth, seventh, and eighth place boats on the water right now with less than a minute and a half to go. Yeah, but the problem with Al Hamli here is, look, he's not only having the rough conditions, but he's got the dirty water of the boat in front of him. And there's only three boats out on this circuit at the moment. What they should do is they should give him a little bit more of a gap. But he's, I think he's managed, yeah, he's overtaken your... Uh, he has overtaken Jonas Anderson coming down there now. Down the long back straight as he almost flies the boat coming into that right-hander and down the 450 meters straight into the last two turn boys. Just hanging on, desperately hanging on, trying to do what he can here. Here he comes out. This is a tough part of the course as they hit oh, the crossway. He's, he's gone over. Oh, what a shame. Ahmed al Hamli. Desperation move by him turns into major disappointment and Ahmed Al Hamli is blown over and he is done. That's a last lap gasp there, just to try and get into the top six, you know. Al Hamli on the bubbling seventh there. He was absolutely smoking. He came round the right hander, carrying tremendous speed as he went down to the to the last two turn boys. But this is where the difficulty has been, always on that far end of the circuit, and he just lost control. Look at that boat flying out of that water. Totally air airborne, and he came over, and then he finally nose it over 180 degrees, parked it in its rear end, came back up through the transom, and now watch Watch it again. Airborne, can't hold it, desperately. Now he's just a rider as he goes by, crashes on the nose, it comes back hard on the transom, and that ends his day in tears. Is Ahmed Al Hamli trying desperately to get up into the top six. It is not gonna happen. Jonathan, looks like this session has come to a close, and that slammed the door not only on Ahmed Al Hamli, but his teammate, Eric Stark, who probably had another lap and a half to run. He is done for the afternoon, so the Emirates team ends up in disappointment in a big way. They just came as close as they could to make it to the top six in the shootout, and they both missed. And now he's got another boat for tomorrow. We know that. I think that the boat for tomorrow is slightly longer than this one, which will probably suit him. But you could see 
the driver now sits in that area, that cocoon in the, in the, on the front part of the boat, we call it the safety cell. He's strapped in with a five-point harness and he's got a tremendous amount of protection around him. I mean, in years gone by, an accident like that, the best that driver could have hoped for was to be in hospital. It could have been really, really serious. But you know, with the strength of this cockpit, in these incredible accidents it makes sure that the drivers uh, is safe and unable to get out of the boat okay all right jonathan let's go to the replay let's see this one more time and this is on board here we go as we get the osprey rescue team taking the driver out thankfully he looked like he was uh in no worse for wear after going over and uh, obviously uh, really a major surprise for him there as you said it was it was all or nothing, Jonathan, and he got nothing out of it, but at least he gave it his push. And as you said, maybe the boat that he's got as a backup tomorrow, which is longer, may be more favorable for yeah. him. Okay, he's gonna go down, start at midstream. Now let's watch this again, Jonathan. Looks strong, he just got past Jonas Anderson, and there he goes, just too much, he tried to save it. Now he's riding, nose, transom, ending, goodbye. So long, shut the lights off on the way out the door. That's the end of his qualifying for the day, and what a tough break for Ahmed Al Hamli. <laughs> Here we go. As he comes down, as he works his way almost down into turn number five. And there he goes. He launches off. Now he goes upside down. He'll see the nose hit the water. He'll come back up. And the transom hits. And thankfully, Ahmed Al Hamli is okay. <laughs> he goes, hey, you what the heck? He said, I do what I can do. <laughs> uh -huh. What do you reckon? He said, how many points out of 10 for that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. As his teammate goes whistling by. So uh, they love it here. They've got a huge uh, wave of supporters here. They have a lot of the uh, companies that are based here and they've got a wonderful cheering section for Ahmed Al Hamli. He's got his fans and they're all here cheering him on and they know he gave it all that he could, 100% and more, and it ends in tears today. But you know what, again, as we talked about, tomorrow he's gonna have a bigger boat on the water, which could really open up a possibility for him to run even stronger. Even though he's going to start way down in the mid-pack, he may have a better performance, actually, in the bigger boat. Oh, for sure. And the other thing is, you know, it is important at our pole position here, but if these conditions are the same tomorrow as they are today, it's not going to be such a big thing to have that pole position. What you've got to work on now is a boat that is well balanced on top of the water. As, as we said earlier, you've got to put a lot of ballast right around the front end of that boat and uh, pick the right propeller as well. You want a propeller that will really hold the back of the boat on the water. And uh, that's what I would strive for for tomorrow. I, pole position, yes, it is important, but I don't think it's going to be critical if we have these conditions again for the Grand Prix. These are the drivers that are going to move on to Q3. We'll get a shot to get the pole position. So we're going to wait and see how this plays out. Celio Torrente, oddly enough, in large, longer Baba boats that seem yeah. to work well for them. Yusuf Al Roban in the DAC. Alex Corella in a DAC. Philippe Shep, who is the world champion, he got in with the Moore boat. And then Jonas Anderson, of course, in a Mulgard boat. So there you go. You've got different, you got four different boats in the uh, top six in the lineup. But it seems like those longer DACs or the uh, Baba boats seem to really work for these drivers, Celio and Torrente. Yeah, and I think the Mo boat is also working well. I mean, we do know, I spoke to Philippe uh, Desertan earlier. He said, all we're going to do is as much as we need to do. If we feel that we can't make it, we'll go out and put a faster lap up. But we're not going to take any chances. As you see there, Al Hamley kissing off that wave. This, this was a last lap gasp to try and get into that top six. And boy, did he come down hard in the boat. huh? coming from about 130 mile an hour plus to stand still in a, quite a short uh, distance. Yeah, not total desperation, but he knew it was either now or forget it. Mm. You know, because he was frustrated. He was having a hard time to get around Jonas Anderson, mm. but he knew he had to somehow get past him to get clear water like you were talking about. It's got to be clean. Mm. And Jonas Anderson wasn't doing him any favors by going, no. okay, no, you want to no. go around me? Work your way around me. And you yeah. can't blame Jonas for doing that. No, absolutely not, because so, he had to keep his place there in the top six. Yeah, so anyway, he worked his way through, got around, and then just got on it a bit too soon. We were worried about him going across and cutting around turns five and six in the crosswinds, but I'll tell you what, he never even got there. 
Yeah. The interesting thing now, Steve, is, um, I don't know, I spoke to Philip Desertan and he was saying, are they going to have the uh, top six tomorrow morning? Um, I'm not sure. Have you heard any different? Uh, or are we going to go ahead with the end of the session now this afternoon? Actually, uh, we're waiting to find out what the uh, official line is right now. We're not going to tell you to sneak off yet because we're waiting to find out ourselves. But uh, we have two possibilities. We're going to continue on, maybe go sailing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, or else uh, run the boat uh, in the morning, possibly. Yeah. yeah. So we we'll um, just have to keep an eye yeah. now on the UIM officials down there. Absolutely. And, uh, when we know, we'll tell you. How's yeah, that? We can see so. the uh, crew chiefs actually discussing things. I can see Scott Gilman there now just come out of the, uh, the UIM commissioner's uh, uh, caravan down the bottom there. And uh, so I don't know what the decision is. Yeah, you know, we talked about this all the time to find out exactly what the situation was so you know the big thing is can we move on and uh alex radovanovich uh, is back yeah and, we're just uh, going to call him in now steve yeah, just let's to find see out what if the he latest knows is. if he knows more than we do why don't you why don't you uh put the headset on alex you were down there alex you were down there tell us what uh, the latest decision is what do you know at this point well, at this point, uh, the officials decided that we will postpone. <laughs> on the shootout for tomorrow morning, because this condition, uh, they are really bad, and I really support the, the decision of the officials. Okay, so uh, that's, that's probably pretty much uh, what we expected it was going to happen. It was a rough afternoon out here. A lot of desperation, but I'll tell you something. We saw a lot of talent, too, as well, to put in some of those fast times. Yeah, you can see on the end, the conditions were really bad, and some of those drivers, they really uh, pushed their limits on completely. So it was really dangerous, but now you can see who's the best. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, interestingly enough, we talked about Sami Selle and Sean Trente both running a little bit older, longer, Baba boats, and boy, they, they went to the top, you know? Yeah, that's true. They, they really run the boat who are more suitable for these conditions. We were running with the short boat, but we set up the boat perfectly. So I'm really, really happy with our position at the moment. All right. Well, thank you very much for stopping by. Giving us the scoops, my friend. Thank All you right. Very much. Thank you, Alex. And as we watch the boats being towed back in, and they will do some more work on that boat. That boat has had more problems, Jonathan. I'll tell you what. I mean, it's been, it's been uh, beaten up a bit, this boat, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, they're probably going to, if they hold it until the morning, that will make a lot more sense, you know, because uh, I understand that... For today, it, they did promise that the conditions were going to get worse, and then they said tomorrow it was going to get very, very warm, a uh, lot of sunshine, very little wind again. So it does make uh, it does make sense because you know it's it's almost sort of venturing on the area of uh, danger out there, isn't it, Steve? Because you know, like you saw Al Hamley's boat, you, you can see the damage on the front of it there. I mean, you know, he was on borrowed time going going around that far end of the circuit. There really wasn't much he could have done. Uh, he just hit a road wave there and uh, you know but at least he's come out of it safe you know we don't want to see accidents out here where people you know they've got to be taken to hospital and things like that because they've taken uh, uh, you know an extra chance and uh, we'll just have to see what uh, they decide now uh, in the next half hour or so yeah absolutely again we go back on board uh, as the uh, young driver from Abu Dhabi the 36 year old uh, getting his unintentional pilot's license as he took off here just right. see it kissing there, Steve. Right Just there, bang, there. he hits yep. away there, you saw it? It's all and the took. entire boat is like a low-flying aircraft then. Once it, once it goes over a certain angle, there's no going back, you know? Right. It's going to blow over like that. And you could see how important the cell was because he came down really hard on the front. Look, he's wrecked the front of the cell Absolutely. There with the pressure of the water. And uh, you can see the guys there now getting all the water out of the back of the boat. They'll have to strip that engine down, that Mercury 2.5 V6, 400 horsepower engine. So they'll have to get that sorted because he, he'll probably end up running that engine tomorrow, although he'll have to go to the back of the field because he's changing the boat. Uh, and the rules are if you change the engine, if it breaks, or there's some problems with the boat, you decide to use another boat, then uh, you, you go to the back of the field. But I think if they get the boat balanced well for him tomorrow, and I know, you know, the, the, 
Scott Gilman and the crew there, they're very, very skilled people. So they'll have a completely different setup tomorrow and a different approach to the uh, to the race itself. All right, tomorrow, tomorrow, hang in there. We'll let you know on the website when we're coming back on to finish off this Q3 session. We'll start up and find out who will start tomorrow on pole position. The race will be held tomorrow at 1500 local, 1300 GMT. For those stations leaving us now, thanks for being with us. For Jonathan Jones and all the great international TV crew here on Lake Geneva, we want to thank you very much for stopping by. We will see you back here tomorrow as we continue this 19th Grand Prix of France, round number two of this UIM Formula One H2O World Championship. I'm Steve Michael saying thanks for stopping by. Have a lovely evening. We will see you back here for the Grand Prix tomorrow. So long, everybody. Yesterday we had unchangeable uh, conditions that were really unmanageable, so they've elected after the heavy swells to stop things at uh, Q2. We move on to Q3 here, day number two. I'm talking. I'm talking. All right, we're set for Q3 in the first boat coming out. Jonas Anderson as the Swedish driver works his way out onto this race course. He was sixth quickest coming into Q3. And for Jonas Anderson, who has started this year so far, qualified seventh just outside the top six in Doha, but had a nice finish, Jonathan. He finished in the fourth spot in the top five. <laughs> Yeah, and, and he's also, in the time that we've had off between now and the, the last Grand Prix, they've changed this boat significantly. They've designed new sponsons. He said the only thing that's the same is the actual cockpit itself, and he feels they've made a big, big step forward. The other thing is he's improved the engine program where he's, he needs to get the reliability because last year he was struggling. Got a new sponsor, T.A. Schalt and uh, Maskin AB. That's a good friend of his uh, based in Sweden who's putting a lot of uh, money behind this program and uh, let's hope as a partnership it's going to work well for them this year well for this driver out of sweden and this is his 35th time in the top six shootout and he is chasing down his third pole position of his career and he'll be going around for two laps and he is now underway full, full flight down that front straightaway through one now they've adjusted the course a little bit jonathan Turn number two right here as he goes around this point is a little bit closer to the fans, so it's not really 100 meters between two and three. It's just a tad longer. Yeah, they've opened the circuit on both ends, in fact, Steve, and uh, that will change things somewhat, but it, although it's been changed, it's not a massive amount, and uh, that boat's running really well. The only disadvantage he has, Steve, he's the first boat on the water. Nobody's known what the conditions are like, so basically it's a, it's a very unknown quantity for him, but that boat is running out there really well carrying a lot of speed the cornering he tells me is a lot lot better now with his new sponsors and uh, you know hopefully he'll put up a good time all right we check out Jonas Anderson as he comes off turn number six the first time of the afternoon as he slides out down that front straightaway across the timing checkered line as he comes by the start finish and we get the first time of the day as Jonas uh, will now start this lap. Let's see what he'll do here, Jonathan. What they've done is they've elected to give the drivers a full lap to warm up, get to know the race course. So now he's done that exploratory lap. Now he begins the two laps for him to try to see the fast time he can put down. Remember, only two drivers yesterday in the conditions that we had here in Q1 and Q2 did sub 57 second laps. Now for Jonas Anderson, Yesterday, he got a 101, so he had uh, only seven laps in practice yesterday. There we go, coming into the last but one turn by there. Still a little bit lumpy on that part of the circuit. Coming around now, that uh, short shoot of 120, 130 meters, and down past the start-finish line. Let's see what sort of a lap time he puts up. All right, here we go, Jonas Anderson. 51.81, so that's the standard. That's the gauntlet that he's thrown down. He's got a second lap to improve on that. 
So Jonas Anderson out of Fruvi, Sweden in his 70th race start has four victories and this is the 35th time that he's been in the top six qualifying looking for his third career pole here this morning. Again out to turn three down the far side of the circuit. Conditions really, really improved immensely this morning. 460 meters straight into the right-hander, the only right-hander that we have here this weekend, and down to the far end of the circuit, which still is a little bit lumpy down there. You can see the boat as he tries to settle it. He's still being a little bit cautious there, losing a tenth or two of a second, and that's maybe where it's going to make the difference to get pole position here today. All right, did he improve? Let's find out. He did a 51.81. He did. He did a 50.63. So he now has said to the rest of the field, all right, Try to improve on that. So Jonas Anderson does a 50.63, and we're underway here. And uh, I'll tell you something, uh, Philippe Shep is up next, and uh, all eyes in France are on this man who is a defending world champion. Philippe Shep comes into this race with two career poles. This is his 94th start. He's been in the top six shootout 27 times out of 93 starts. Wow. Yeah, and they, they've got a very good setup. Uh, a French team, but obviously called Team China. Uh, the funding comes from China, but very much a French team there. All the mechanics, the boat builder, David Moore's from France. These boats are built in uh, up in northern France, and uh, they've, been de they've been perfecting them now over the last two or three years with Philippe Chap, who's got a, a wealth of experience in these boats, and they really are the bench mark at the moment it's going to be interesting to see with uh, with Philippe Chap how, is he going to be any quicker than Jonas Anderson and we don't know because as I said Jonas they've changed the boat they've altered many many things on that boat he's getting more horsepower from the engines um, this boat actually uh, as I said designed in France by David Moore um, engine uh, is actually a Mercury 2.5 V <laughs> Six two stroke, uh, and the tuning work on this engine is done by Alex Ledden, who comes from Montreal, the French part of uh, Canada, and together they have a very, very strong package which allowed him to win the championship last year. All right, Philippe Shep, who has gotten poles in two of the last uh, three races, he got him back to back to end the season a year ago in Abu Dhabi and Sharjah. Enough to get him home for his first world title, and for the first time in 35 years, a Frenchman won the world championship. And here he comes out of the corner, down through turn number three, heading for the right-hander. Tell you what, he looked like he was on rails yesterday morning in practice, Jonathan, when the conditions were very similar to what they are now. Yeah. I don't know whether he's going to be as quick as Jonas. He took a quite a wide line there between two and three and lost a bit of ground there, I, no doubt about it again. It's obviously difficult down that far end. He's swinging it round right. Here we go. This is where he's going to do his two laps, and we'll see how much of a difference there is between Chiap, the current world champion, and Jonas Anderson, the Swedish driver. All right, Philippe Schiff now racing down, coming through the corner, back through one, heading down in toward turn number two. That's 590 meters down through that point as he circumnavigates a hard 90-degree left turn. Moves up about 150 meters into turn number three. Almost lost it. Oh, my. Tiptoeing his way through as he was able to save it. Almost barrel rolled it, Jonathan. Wow. But, you know, the other thing, Steve, is that he knows. Oh, and he almost lost control again there as he came through that right hand at turn number four. This is not going to be a fast lap, in my opinion. He's going to have to regroup get out there, settle down a little bit. He's got a lot of pressure on him because he's a French driver at the French Grand Prix. And uh, let's see if he can do a better better time this one round. All right, he's gonna surrender the first lap, just get himself into position. He takes it way wide. This is it, his last opportunity. This will be lap number two. First one on the board. Of course, he backed off, did a 40, 54, 9, 1. But here he goes. This is his last opportunity to steal pole, get the opportunity to put himself number one here at his home Grand Prix. Into turn two, very, very nice turn. The boat's accelerating really well off the corners, and it looks like he's got some good top-end speed. So uh, is he going to beat Jonas Anderson with this one lap that he's got now? Philippe Shep now slides through the right-hander. Looked a lot nicer and cleaner that time around. Building the confidence as he works his way down, as he flies that boat down into turn number five. 
hooks it on a dime, gets it down around the corner, heading for six. Philippe Shep in perfect trim coming out of the corner. This will be a flyer. We'll see if he can do better than a 56-3. Did he go to number one? He did. He did a 47-6-9. Oh. oh, my. What a time. And he just throws down the gauntlet on that one, Jonathan. That was a flyer. That boat is running well out here, Steve. And I noticed there on the far end of the circuit between turn five and the last turn, he was carrying a lot more speed into the turn and accelerating better out of it than Jonas Anderson. And that is a blistering time, 47.69 against 50.63. Now that's the second fastest time of the weekend. Only Sean Torrente in practice yesterday when the conditions were a bit different at a 47.5. So uh, that's a strong performance by Philippe Shep. Now, but if, well, you look at the times from yesterday, Steve, you know, although we, we appear to think they've changed the circuit, and uh, I don't know, perhaps we were wrong, because today he did a 47.69. Yesterday, his fastest lap was a 47.73. So really nothing in it, is there? No, there really isn't. And now here comes the three-time world champion, Alex Corella, who lost his championship to the French driver, Philippe Shep, a year ago at the very last race in Sharjah. Started this season season gangbuster strong he won the first race in Doha won the second race in China looked like he was on his way to a startling performance but the problem was he started having bad luck and it happened at his home race course in Doha a year ago when he smashed the buoys and uh, now he has switched teams he's with team Abu Dhabi and Alex Corella is getting himself into the groove here as he has taken his exploratory lap as he comes down out of turn number three, heading for the right-hander. And let's see what this young driver from Italy can do. As he is running a brand new boat. This boat came fresh out of the factory and Como, he helped build it with Guido Capellini's DAC racing team. They've got a pair of brand new boats. Of course, David Del Pin, his teammate, crashed heavily earlier in the day yesterday and uh, he was eliminated from the proceedings. But here comes Alex Corella. And Corella, the Italian, now giving it a run. He wants to get himself back up. And he is flying the wow. boat and off he goes. Huh? That looked like a low-flying aircraft as it came down past the start-finish line, going down the 500 meters straight into turn number two. Let's see how he takes that corner, Steve. Good corner, good acceleration. Boat tends to get a little bit wet on the corner there with him, so he has scrubbed a bit of speed off. And now he's on the far end of the circuit, coming down to the right-hander, which is turn number four. Alex Corella from Italy, driving for Team Abu Dhabi. And for Corella coming into this race, he's had seven wins in his last 17 starts. Corella today looking for his 11th pole of his career. And he comes out of turn number six. Not as clean as we thought out of five. Let's see what he does. We'll check the time. This will be the first of two laps for Alex Corella. Can he go to the top? He does not. He gets close, though. Does a 47.84. He's .15 off the time of Philippe Schiff. Yeah, he got another lap to go for. I think he was a bit ragged on that first lap. Definitely down from the right-hander down to the far end of the circuit from turn number four to five. Almost lost control of the boat, probably overdriving the boat just a little bit, Steve. But, you know, they've had limited testing with this new design. Um, they did test on Lake Homo just before coming here, so they don't know exactly. Oh, and again, there he has to settle the boat, turning around that right-hander, scrubs a bit of speed off, but is he going to be any quicker this time round as that boat bounces on top of the water into the last turn boy. Slapping it back and forth on the water. Let's see if it's the time that it's going to be. Doesn't look good for Corella though, but it can be deceiving. Did he get the time? Did he get the top spot? He did not. He did a 48-7. Jonathan, a good second slower than what he did in that first lap. Yeah, trying too hard, Steve. That's what it is. Okay. You notice with Philippe Chap, that boat never left the water. The back end of the boat, although there was probably only a centimeter of two of the, of the boat in the water, it was just held perfectly as he went around. And, Ch and uh, Chap, uh, Carell, I beg your pardon there, just overdriving that boat a little bit too much, trying too hard. And when you do that, you just scrub speed. You know, he made a mistake on that right hand the first time round. He made another mistake as he accelerated out of the, the right-hander there, got the boat far too loose, and you could see it was rocking all over the place. And, you know, that's worth probably a second there. And uh, I think if he calms down, he could have had pole position, but not driving like that. 
Well, that was a bit of a surprise, but again, it's a learning process. He's trying to learn this new boat that he was uh, getting uh, used to that just came out of the factory a couple weeks ago. Now here's an interesting driver, Yusuf Al-Robian. He comes over from Formula Two. Yusuf Al-Robian is starting his 21st Formula One race. He's been in five previous top five performances. He's never grabbed the pole. But uh, he is looking for his uh, second podium and his first career win. So Yusuf Al-Robian, the driver from Kuwait, had his best finish in four races in Doha, where he finished uh, seventh last year. So let's see what he can do, Jonathan. He's known for being a speedster, especially in match racing in Formula 2. He's still trying to get himself established in Formula One. Yeah, yesterday, I mean, he was knocking on the door all afternoon, wasn't he? I mean, uh, he was top of the list. He was on pole position in practice. Then he dropped down to fourth or fifth. Then he was back up again to being the fastest boat. So we know the boat's got tremendous potential and uh, it's going to be interesting. If he can get a clean lap where he, again, doesn't overdrive that boat, um, this could be a guy to watch out for this weekend. Yeah, Yusuf Al-Robian in his 21st star, as we talked about last year, was a washout with two DNFs, two crashes and one penalty. And here we go. The first of two after his exploratory lap. Comes out of turn number six, takes it wide, and now we should see him come by in anger as he'll fly that DAC boat just past us right now as he goes past the start-finish line. Looking good. You can see the back of the boat is rock solid on the water there. The angle of attack of the boat is really, really good, Steve. Carrying some good speed into turn number two now. Let's see how he gets around there. Not bad. Again, settles the boat just a little bit too much. Gets a bit too much of the boat in the water, and that causes drag, which takes some of the speed off. But uh, looking good at the moment. As he comes through, bouncing his way down, it looks like there's a, a bit of a wash there coming out through the right hand. Right hander looked pretty good. Yeah, yeah. All right, as he takes it down with two more pins to go on the first of two laps as he goes chasing for pole position. Yusuf Al-Robian out of five, looking down, staring at turn number six. A tricky corner here, especially yesterday in the first two sessions. Can he beat a 47-6-9? <laughs> Eight seventeen, Steve. So he's in third position. He's got another chance again there now to see if he can improve on that. Again, he needs to just calm down a little bit. You could hear the engine on the rev limiter there as he went down the long back straight. Looks a bit better out of that corner now from turn number two to three. There's 100 meters. Uh, yes, looking good, looking good. But uh, whether he's going to find the second, second and a half, we don't know. Yeah, he needs to get another half second up to take over this pole position as he comes out of the corner now. Final two turns for Yusuf Al-Robian out of Kuwait, trying to steal pole position here. As he circles out of turn number six, rifles his way down, full flight, look at the boat fly, can he beat a 47-6-9 and move to number one. He moves to number two. Good effort, Steve. 47-83 against the fastest time of 47-69. Good effort there from the uh, Kuwaiti driver, uh, Rubayan, and uh, boy, I mean, he's running a DAC boat built in Italy, uh, just like the uh, the Abu Dhabi team, and at the moment, he seems to have the legs on them. Yeah, he's got a little bit older boat. We chatted with him last night over dinner, and he was uh, really jacked up about his uh, mm. excitement for coming into this top six and really trying to show off the performance. They haven't had as much testing as they were hoping for, Jonathan, but they're uh, he with uh, Alex Radovanovich, they're going to try to do their best to spend more time together, especially with Yusuf Al-Robian in the hot desert trying to uh, get away from the heat. Yeah, they've got, they're actually going to buy another boat, he was telling us, and they're going to keep that in Kuwait, and they're going to do a lot of testing there because he feels that, you know, there's no question that seat time is very, very important, uh, and that will give him the confidence to push that boat even further. Now, here's a guy to look out for. Sean Torrente from America, Steve, running uh, with a victory team out of Dubai. He only sat in this boat for the first time yesterday and put up a blistering time out there. Is he going to get pole position today? Sean Torrente, who did a 47.5 in practice, that until the time has been the uh, fastest time that we have seen. Let's see what he can do here for Torrente. Coming in, he's been red hot. He's won two of his last four starts. He won the opener. He leads this championship with 20 points. He's on his exploratory lap as he comes whistling down with that boat. As he goes down in toward turn number one, what do you think, Jonathan? 
He's running the boat really well. Now, this boat is slightly longer than a lot of the boats that we've seen so far today, and that may help here, Steve, because this afternoon we're expecting the wind to pick up. It's going to get a little bit rougher, and a longer boat makes it so much easier in, in the rough conditions. But uh, if anybody's going to get pulled, this guy can do it. He's a very, very talented driver. He was racing for the Qatar team, which uh, disbanded after the first Grand Prix. He's the points leader this year, and he really wants to... He feels that this year could be his year for the World Champions and you know yesterday sat in the boat for about five minutes and bang put it on port on not on pole but uh, on the fastest lap so if anybody can do it Sean Torrente can all right Sean Torrente now starting to mellow himself out a bit now focuses in on the final corner it's time to get down to business two laps to go for the American out of Miami let's see what Sean Torrente can do he finished third in the championship a year ago had a chance to win the title had bad luck couldn't get it down and underway he goes Sean Torrente driving for the victory team had a boat that's been sitting in a shed for the last two years in the heat, and they worked like gangbusters to get this crew to get it back into ship shape as he goes down into turn number one, now heading for two, Jonathan. Turns the boat really well there, Steve, pulls it back tight into the next turn. You can see there, good acceleration. Look, nothing of the boat as he almost overdoes it, coming out of turn number three then down to the right-hander. Torrente, who was in the past known as being overly aggressive, has really settled down and matured as a driver. Let's see what he does here as he flies the boat in perfect formation now. Two more corners to go on this opening lap, chasing the pole. The fast time to beat is a 47.69. Comes out of the corner. Slides it through, heading down toward the start finish line. Can he go faster than a 47.69? We'll get the time on him. Does not. He does a 48.61. He's behind Alex Corella. So uh, disappointing for the American driver. Maybe too small a propeller, Steve. You could hear that engine on the rev limiter way, way before turn number two. That's a 500 meter straight there from one to two. And he was on the rev limiter halfway down the straight, which means once you get onto that, you're not going to increase the speed. He also overdrove the boat out to turn number three. We could see that he was just a little bit too loose there. He looks a bit smoother this time. He knows he's got a he's got his lap time on the um, on the dash of that boat, so he know how he knows how well he's doing and he knows how well everybody else is doing and he knows he's got to push a bit harder all right out of five out of six can he improve sitting in fourth place the man who leads this championship in points for the victory <laughs> Sean Torrente still another pole position as he comes by, and he doesn't improve. The time was a little bit quicker, but pretty steady at a 48.08. And Jonathan, you may have hit it right on the on the uh, nail, the, the hammer, because probably he did make a wrong choice in the prop, as you yeah. said, and it just didn't get any faster for him. He's got to be disappointed. No, I mean, yesterday he was consistent at 47.50. Uh, he was by far the quickest boat around here. You know, he's two tenths of a second quicker than anybody else. Um, and now Torrente is sitting 48.08. So he's, he's lost a lot of speed there, and the conditions appear to be perfect out there this morning. And the only thing I can think it is, is uh, propeller choice and propellers are so important on these boats we don't have a gearbox where you change gear like a car and you have to pick the right propeller the propeller that's good for acceleration for the mid-range and also for the top speed of the boat and for the first time in a long time Steve we've got this type of circuit where I think this afternoon we, we fingers crossed we'll have the best Grand Prix that we've seen for a long time because it's a lot more open longer straights and it gives people the opportunity to overtake what we've seen in past Grand Prix it they're so short pole position tends to get win the race every time because you've got 250 meter straights 100 meter straights and there's just no chance but here with this open water long long straights I think for it we're in for a blinding Grand Prix Sami Selio out of Finland a two-time world champion 2007 2010 the most active conqueror of pole position he's got 22 career poles set a record one time by getting four poles in a row and uh, tell you what Sami Selio has 78 top six performances in the shootout coming in today this is race number 126 for Sami Selio the driver out of Helsinki Finland driving the Bob Bob boat and down he goes and this interesting thing Jonathan is that the boat selection that they made for him he's been struggling with it he's had it for about a year but they keep fine-tuning it 
Yeah, they've changed the sponsons again on this boat. Uh, they've altered quite a lot of it. Um, my understanding, and I may be wrong, but my understanding is that he, uh, just like Philippe Chap, is running one of uh, Alex Ledden's engines out to Montreal in Canada. And uh, yesterday he looked very, very strong out there. And uh, we'll just have to see how he gets on this morning. But you're right, Steve. You said that they really have struggled with this boat. Um, you know, just because you have a new boat and a new design, it doesn't mean that it's any better than the one before. And the other boat, he was so confident in that boat that he'd always be on the money and he had so many pole positions. This boat is, is supposedly a step ahead, but you know, it's very, very flighty, difficult to keep on the water as it goes down past the start finish line, down to turn number two. Doesn't look to me, Steve, like he's carrying as much speed as uh, Chiap did, but, you know, time's going to tell. All right, as he comes through a critical turn number two, this is the 90-degree left-hander setting himself for 150 meters into turn number three. Slides the boat out, now heads toward the right-hander, Jonathan. Good corner there, Steve. Really good acceleration off the turn. You could see the boat was, you know, not, it wasn't flying around anywhere. It was very, very stable, but hardly any... Oh, and a beautiful right-hander there. This could be an interesting lap. All right, as Celio heads down to the final two pins now. Let's see him go through turn number five, sets the boat down quickly. Uh, airs it out, gets way too much air on the boat. That's going to hurt him as he comes out at turn number six, not as clean. Needs to beat a 47.69. Let's check the time. He is slower than Trente, did a 48.82. He's down in fifth position now. He's going to have to really gather it up and suck it up this time in the final turn. I, I don't know, I might be wrong, but I, I tell you, he's going to have to really press hard on this lap to get there. But you could see on that last but one turn, boy, he came in there a little bit slow and then over trimmed the boat coming on to the, the last turn, which is which is now turn number six there before the start finish line and lost a lot of time there. So he needs to calm down a little bit. Good turn on the right hander, good acceleration. I don't know if he's carrying as much top speed as some of these front runners, but uh, Steve, he's into the last but one over to you. All right, as he comes out of that final turn, flies the boat heading into six. Looked a little cleaner that time. Let's see if he can move himself up farther. He's sitting in fifth. He needs to get a 47.69 to take the pole. And he does not. He does a 48-6-1. So he will start in fifth position. Philippe Shep of France gets the pole here at his home Grand Prix with a 47.69. And for Philippe Shep, that's his third career pole position in his 94th start. And he has got to be elated as all of France. And he felt so much pressure to do well. Tell you what, he did a sparkling run. We're on this six pin 2.08 course here on the lake. Yeah, no <laughs> there Steve very very smooth all the way round they're working with a guy called Mr. Dynamite with the propellers and uh, he he doesn't want to work with any other team this year he wants to stick with that team and uh, I noticed yesterday he brought along a lot of new propellers and as they were taking the cover off the propeller and, and dropping the boat into the water I had a good look at one or two of them and uh, they're quite different to, the, to the, the shapes were different to what I've seen on other propellers and uh, you know maybe that's what's making the difference between Philippe Chiappa at the moment but they've got a very strong as I said all round package which really does make the difference and um, you know he's the guy today that uh, I'm sure that all these other drivers are going to be looking at and trying to, to, to beat. So there you go the CTIC China team jumps at a start Philippe Shep gets his third career pole position his first of the year he's second in the championship trail he'd love to win this afternoon in front of his tens of thousands of fans here along Lac Lamois we'll find out if he can get the job done today so we're down with qualifying and Philippe Shep is number one here in France as he will set off for round number two of this 2015 UIM Formula One World Championship Tour and the 19th Grand Prix of France here in lovely Evian in France. Tell you what, it's going to be fun. We're going to be heading back uh, to uh, you look back in the past times that we've been here in France. Now, you're a two time winner. What does it mean to win in Europe? Big oh, deal. it means a lot. There's no question about it. And I mean, this Grand Prix, there are so many people that have come from all over Europe uh, to, to watch the race, and it's, it's going to be a blinder, Steve. All right, so don't run off. We're going to have the final event of the weekend, the Grand Prix itself, starting at 1500 local 1300 GMT for Jonathan Jones and all our great international TV crew I'm Steve Michael saying we'll see you later on we're less than five hours from the start of the second Grand Prix of 2015 so long everybody